Good. So here we go. Thank you all for coming. Um, it's really nice to be here. So thank you also to the organization. And I'm a bit nervous because yeah, how they have already told you it's my first time, but also because I'm going to tell you a personal story which may not end up super, super well. But anyway, I hope you like it because this story started last year in October. And by that time, COVID cases were not that high. So we were allowed to go to clubs to celebrate, um, for example, Halloween. So, we together with, okay, this work? Yeah. Now, good. So, with some friends of mine, we went to a Dia de los Muertos party, like the Mexican version. I hope if there is some Mexican, don't get offended for this. And I dressed up as Freddie Mercury. Of course, for the death part, but also because it was kind of easy. So, we went to this party, it was really nice, the music was kind of great, so it was very good, but it got even better. I meet new people, I meet a lovely German girl who I just got from YouTube, um, from Google, sorry, <laughs> and who was dressed up as a ghost. And well, basically we dance, we laugh, and at the end of the night, since we both have to leave, we exchange phone numbers. During the next days, we keep in touch, and at some point mm, we say, okay, let's just grab some dinner and, uh, in some local restaurant. So there we go. We met at nine, I was there a few minutes before, quite rare for a Spanish guy. I was excited. But anyway, I wait for her there, and then I thought, oh, I've never been here, so just in case that she's inside, let's text her. So I text her, um, hello, I'm in front of the restaurant, are you close? And when I'm doing this, I check the hour. And I realize that, well, if I don't go in and she's not there, we are gonna lose the reservation, so I go in. So I'm in this table, she's still not there, but it's still early, so I wait for her. But the waiter appears, and of course, yeah, do you want to drink something? Yeah, why not? Let's get a beer. I drink it, maybe too fast, but anyway, I finish my beer, I'm there waiting, and I check my phone, still no reply. It's already half past night, but well, not that bad, but anyway, she's German, so maybe let's call her because it's a bit weird. So I call her and she didn't reply. So yeah, I was being ghosted by a ghost. So anyway, <laughs> it was not that late for my standards, so I wait until the waiter appears again. Because it was like a weekend, so you cannot really just order one beer. So I was hungry, I ordered some food, I finish my food, and well, she didn't arrive. And as you may be imagining right now, she didn't arrive at all. So, <laughs> yeah, it was a bit sad. But anyway, this helps me to introduce tonight's topic, which is by, oops, I, I did a mess now. Now I'm sad. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second. Good. Uh -huh. Good. So the topic is Bayesian inference for quantum science. Everything is going to be about quantum today. So. What is Bayesian inference about? It sounds weird, but it's very natural. Like, let's recap what happened. So at 8.55, more or less, I arrived to the restaurant. Who of you thought by that time that she was coming? Please raise your hand if you think she was coming. OK, very optimistic crowd. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so at 9.15, I go inside. She's not there. Who of you thought that she was coming? OK, still pretty lot of hands. Thank you. And then I call her. She don't reply. How are those hands? Okay, <laughs> that's optimistic people. And then I eat my dinner alone, so I guess, yeah, some, oh fuck, that's, that's an attitude, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, she didn't come. And what happened here? I asked you something, whether she was coming or not, and I've given you more information. And with this new information, you have been basically making better guesses. And on average, you were like very well directed, so congratulations. But anyway, this, Mm, kind of natural um, procedure of just updated when you think about something. It's something we do all the time, like when we are in a traffic jam, maybe arriving late to some um, dinner with a friend, whatever. Um, that's what happened, no, not really. But anyway, so it's natural, but not so natural for a computer. If you want a computer to do that, you need some formulas, and you need the Bayes theorem. But if you're not familiar or you don't like this formula, don't worry, I have another one which looks better, which is this one, in which the prior is basically what I used to think. In this case, that she was coming. And then you have the likelihood, which is how the new information, like eating your dinner alone, um, challenge that previous thought. And with this new information, you update your thoughts, you get a posterior, what you think now. In my case, that she was not coming. So, <clears throat> 
I told you like the very basics of Bayes inference, but there is another ingredient. Not all information is equally useful, as you may imagine. For example, if I ask um, a computer to tell me, oops, this is a bit brighter than I expected. Well, if I ask to a computer, um, how long is this book? I will probably expect that the computer focus on the corner. Here, it's meant to be like the page number. You cannot see it, but it's, it's there. <laughs> And then after that, it will probably focus on the, how thick the book is. And with that, it will get a good, uh, an approximation. The content of the book, well, now it's not readable, but it will not be useful anyway. And of course, the contours of the image are not useful neither. And with this, even if I just cannot go through the pages one by one, I already make, good, make half a good guess and tell people, well, whether this book is thicker or not than some others. And with this, I basically gain information. But of course, I don't work telling people how long their books are. What I do is to characterize quantum dots, which is what I came to talk today. Quantum dots are basically traps for electrons. So you just put electrons in different levels, you play around with them, and with that, you can build qubits and eventually quantum computers, which I don't know if you have heard about, I hope so, but anyway. They are really useful machines, and to understand these dots, you need to understand how the um, electrons behave on them. And believe it or not, they are kind of Mario in Mario Bros. They behave a bit like that, because they also start in some kind of platform in the source. So they start from this energy level, and then they say, OK, they just want to go down. So they always try to go down, down. So this one will start in the source, go through the drain, look around, and will not see any other lower level. So it will remain there. But then, when the next arrive, even though that the drain is still lower, you see it here, and the level which have in front, it's higher. So it will not jump. I mean, it's super lazy. So if, only if it's down. So if we want the electrons to keep crossing, we need to push these levels down, the ones from the dot, which is something we can do. And in this case, um, the good Mario, um, well, the electron, will go into the dot and then will go to the drain, generating a flux. We can also increase the gap, so make it easier for more electrons to pass, and we can also invert the direction, invert the flux. And this is basically how a, a quantum dot behaves. And if we put this like in a plot, if we play with um, how much we push the level of the dots up or down, and with the gap size, we get this fancy plot here it's meant to be um, a bit more blue, but you trust me. And um, basically, the red part indicates that your the electrons are going to the from the source to the drain. The blue indicates the other way around, and the middle part is the one that we are interested in. It's just when the electrons are just staying and no flux is going. <clears throat> so we don't really care about how many electrons are running or in which direction. We just care whether they are running or not. So we will focus on these diamonds these blocked regions. And if we know that, we know basically everything we need to know from the dot and from any other dot that we may have. Again, some blue has been lost, but there are diamonds there. Trust me. So how does this work? How do we get new information? We start taking some points from this diagram. And with these points, we can already make guesses, like you did with my failed relations. So with these guesses, we can already um, plot several dots, which still look a bit blurred, and also get a blurred version of the uncertainty. So this will be like the variance, like how doubtful I am about whether there is current or not. And is there precisely where I measure next? And by doing that several times, I basically get rid of all my uncertainties and just get a nice picture of where the blockade is. So this is a nice tool because I basically don't have to waste a lot of time just measuring and doing it by my own. It's very efficient, it's flexible, it allows me to work with a lot of them. It's also transparent. I know why the computer um, is doing what it's doing, which is something not that common. And also, I know um, that it's honest. It tells me when it's doubt doubting. It tells me when this results. So I don't go like riot because the computers tell me so. And finally, and with this I conclude, it's good for students because then they are not exploited analyzing hundreds and hundreds of dots, which is what usually happens. So think about it and thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos, for this very insightful uh, presentation.